we're in the season of Lent, and Lent is a time of reflection and contemplation on the life and sacrifice of Jesus, and hopefully at a time of expansion of our faith as a result of these moments that we take. So we decided here at McDougal to use Lent to consider ethical issues from a faith perspective. And I hope you received that flyer about the Modern Ethical Dilemmas series, and it continues on Wednesday evenings and Sunday mornings until Easter. And I think we chose this because it's important as Christians to engage the world where it is at. And we bring our faith perspective and speak to how humanity is impacted by cultural trends, and so I hope you will consider joining us for one or all of our sessions. When I think about ethics, I think about my favorite movie, it's favorite if you judge it by the number of times I have willingly viewed it. And it's called The Mission. I first saw it when I was in my 20s, a time in my life when I wrestled with my faith and what it meant for me. Because for a time I had thought I could abandon the notion of God or at least of God having any relevance in my life. But by 1986, when the film came out, I decided, okay, there is a God. And that this belief in God made some claims on my own life in terms of how I should behave. And that the church, though flawed, was at least attempting to understand how we could live together in peace. But my role in that, how I should believe and live, was still very much up for grabs. That's the time in my life that I actually joined the United Church. Because the people I met at Trinity St. Paul's in Toronto were more interested in questions than in answers and in transforming the world than developing a personal faith. I can't remember why I decided to see this film. I think it was because I loved Robert De Niro. But the unfolding of the story presented to me a question about the, what the role of a Christian is when confronting violence and the power of the state. It set up this quandary, which I still live with. When you encounter evil, do you pray or do you fight? For those of you who don't know the story of the mission, it revolves around these two priests that are in Spanish South Africa in the 1740s. And one, Father Gabriel, is the leader of a Jesuit mission to indigenous people called the Guarani. And the Guarani have thus far been unreceptive to Christianity. The last priest who came to preach to them was strapped to a cross and thrown over the falls. And Father Gabriel, who had sent this priest, decides that it his, it's his job to set up a mission there. And he brings along a secret weapon, his oboe. And by playing a haunting melody, the Guarani allow him to live. And eventually, many are receptive to his message and they, they build this mission house. The other character, Rodrigo Mendoza, has a different relationship with these indigenous people, the Guarani. He is a slave owner catcher who captures and sells them to local plantation owners who have benefited from their free labor. He sinks into a deep depression after he kills his brother who's having an affair with his fiancée. And though he's been absolved of the crime because it was a crime of passion at that time, that was okay. He can't seem to forgive himself. And so Father Gabriel, who happens to be in town at the time, suggests that he come up to their mission in the jungle and find redemption by working with the Guarani. And there's this great scene, if you've ever seen the movie, where he carries his weapons of war and of slavery wrapped up in a, a, a net that's like about this big. And he carries this burden up a steep mountain. It's so heavy, he slips and falls. But he always gets up and he starts again, because this is how he will redeem himself. And when he finally meets the Guarani, they, of course, recognize him as this slave trader. And one takes out a knife. And he's sure that this is going to be his end. But in this act of forgiveness, instead of killing him, they use this knife to cut the rope and release the burden that he's been carrying. And in that moment, Mendoza is freed from his guilt. 
So over time, he hears this story of love and forgiveness that Father Gabriel is preaching, and he too becomes a priest at the mission. But unfortunately, even jungle missions are subject to politics. And the Treaty of Madrid that was signed in 1750 reapportioned South American land where the Jesuits were stationed between Portugal and Spain. Now, Spain had already outlawed slavery, but Portugal, to whom these lands were going, still allowed it. And Father Gabriel pleads with the Spanish emissary, who is a Jesuit priest, to protect the missions as safe havens for the Guarani so that they will not be enslaved, even if the land is transferred. But the Portuguese colonists who live in that area want to continue slaving and want these missions destroyed and the indigenous people to keep serving them. So Cardinal Altamirano, who is the emissary, has a very difficult decision. And he, it's a choice between two evils. There is no good answer. Because if he decides in favor of the colonists, the Guarani will be enslaved. But if he rules in favor of the missions, the entire Jesuit order may be condemned by the Portuguese, and the Catholic Church that is in Europe would fracture. So although he's moved by the mission and all it has done, and he loves the people, he decides in favor of the colonists so that he can preserve the Jesuit order and the order in Europe. And the missions are destroyed, and the Guarani are told to go back into the jungle. But on the mission of Father Gabriel, the priests are divided on how they're going to respond to this, because the Guarani say, I don't want to return to the jungle. The devil is in the jungle. So Father Gabriel decides he will stay with them, even though he's been ordered to return. And he will march in a kind of protest with a cross raised high. And Father Mendoza, who was the slave trader, decides he's going to fight. And he teaches the Guarani the European methods of war that he has learned. And he asks Father Gabriel before this final battle to give him a blessing. And Gabriel refuses because he believes that violence is a direct crime against God. And Mendoza believes that even though that may be so, he must fight injustice whatever the cost. And so as the Portuguese military approach, Mendoza and some other priests and the Guarani set up these traps and they have these initial victories. But eventually their plan is thwarted and they are shot. And when the soldiers see the church inside the mission, they're reluctant to fire because, of course, they are Catholic too. And some of them bow on their knees and make the sign of the cross. But they are ordered to enter the village. And as they do, they see Father Gabriel carrying this cross and this sacrament. And women and children are singing an Ave Maria. And they shoot them still. Rodrigo dies as he's watching Father Gabriel being downed. And so in the aftermath of this, this cardinal asked the local governor if this bloodshed was really necessary. And the governor replies that what happened was unfortunate, but inevitable. And he says this, we must work in the world. And the world is thus. And the old Jesuit priest replies, no, no. Thus have we made the world. Thus have I made it. And the film ends finally with some young Guarani children returning to the village and picking up some tokens of their past life. And across the street, the screen comes this verse from John. And it says, The light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness hath not overcome it. Now, I've seen this movie six or seven times, and each time I cry, and even telling you the story, it really moves me. Because I am conflicted as a Christian when I ask this basic question. When confronted with injustice, do we pray or do we fight? When we have only two evils, how do we choose? Should preserving the church or the culture trump the lives of minorities? And there is actually no easy answer to these questions. They are ethical questions. 
Because our response should be based in values that we hold as a result of our faith. And we ask the question, is the practice of our faith a personal journey of redemption, like Rodrigo thought going up the hill was going to be? Or is it a mission to redeem the world? We see these both paths at play in our both paths at play in our world. Just look at the response this week to the Parkland shooting. In a school. Thoughts and prayers is the response of some Christians. And others say no, we must work to change the gun culture and institute gun control. That is the Christian response to this. So as followers of Christ, we are called to live good lives, to be salt of the earth and the light of the world. And how do we do that? There are no easy answers. The band is going to sing a song for us called Oxygen. The Genesis story that we read today is one that the rabbis would tell in response to the question, why is the world broken? Why aren't things the way God wants them to be? My husband said to me this morning, why is nakedness the worst thing that they notice once their eyes are opened? It's a good question, and one without any clear answer, but I suppose that issues about sex and sexuality have been central to questions about sin and brokenness from the beginning of time. Because the drives that we have as humans sometimes push us to behave in ways that are sometimes destructive and oppressive. So taming sexual desire has been the goal of many traditions, as foolhardy and short-sighted as that may be. But I think that this story shows is that Adam and Eve are in the middle of paradise and they are at one with nature and God. And when they disobey and their eyes are opened, they focus on themselves and each other. And they see themselves. And they're vulnerable. And they want to cover up, to hide in some way. And so the fig leaves. And God seems to buy into this because before he sends them out of the garden, before God sends them out of the garden, God makes clothes for them, it says. Animal skins. This is an act of love in the midst of their punishment. And so for Christians, this fall from paradise that is the story of Adam and Eve is reversed by the sacrifice of Jesus somehow. That's the traditional way of looking at it. And so with the resurrection moment, the power of sin and death is reversed. And we, as a community of Christ, are fighting back the darkness. We are shining the light. We are living in hope that one day all will be restored. And I guess this idea about bringing back paradise is the work of ethics. Taking decisions that enhance human flourishing, making attempts to do what is right, trying desperately to love your neighbor as yourself and figuring out what that means. That's what work of ethics and our faith is all about. But unfortunately, we fail. And with all our hope and faith and good works, the world continues in brokenness. I'm a big fan of Obama, but I remember Sarah, Sarah Palin saying, and I really hate to quote her actually, now you know my politics. She said, how's that hopey changey thing going? Don't you feel sometimes as a Christian, like people are saying that thing to you? How's that hopey changey thing going for you? So some of us try to create a bubble we can live in. And we construct worlds where we don't need to confront the pain and suffering of the world. And we only listen to people we agree with and we read stories and articles that confirm our worldview. And we dismiss people who don't quite fit. And we blame victims for the harm they endure. Because this somehow is how we feel safe. We begin to believe that if everyone just lived according to the values that we hold... The world would be a better place and all would be well. And then the jury decides that Gerald Stanley didn't mean to shoot Colton Bushy, even though he brought out a gun and pointed it at his head. 
And Colton was seen to have been responsible for his death in some way because he was trespassing and drinking. And we see the shooting in the U.S. that blames 17 deaths on mental health. And planes go down this week, killing everyone on board. And even the Olympics cannot soothe our minds completely. Where is paradise? How long, God, must we wait? That phrase we sang, how then shall I live? is asked in many and various ways and is quoted by many Christians. It seems to refer to several verses in the Christian scriptures which sit in space of wonder. And they recognize that Jesus has somehow upended all they thought was true. The resurrection moment has given them a glimpse of eternal life. His call to community has changed the way they gather the commandment to love one another has shifted their understanding of how to live their lives. And so knowing all of this, how then shall we live? Because one thing is certain, following Jesus will change everything. Making decisions about what is right, action, is the stuff of ethics. And for thousands of years, Thinkers and philosophers have tried to decide the best way to arrive at what is right and good. And it isn't easy. And it isn't clear. But we keep working at it. Nothing wrong with thoughts and prayers, but then we need to act. And so we continue in hope. And we trust in grace. And we stumble along as Christ, our light. Amen.